This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Tim Ashman, Johnny Hernandez, High Tech Oki. On this episode of DTNS, the essential info on Intel's new round of desktop chips, real wireless power comes to toothbrushes, and what all those Apple rumors actually mean right now. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, October 16th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And coming from all of our nation's capital, your boy, Chris Ashley. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Ah, Chris Ashley, thank you for uh, coming in and kicking off the week with us, man. Perfect way to start my week. I'm not turning that down. Likewise. Uh, Netflix has expanded its cloud gaming beta test from Canada and the UK to now include U.S. Netflix subscribers. Let's see what else is in the quick hits. Last year, coding help platform Stack Overflow doubled its employee base up to around 500, but it happened right as a bunch of those AI-generated code assistance tools from places like OpenAI and Microsoft began appearing, and the company fought it, instituted a ban on users posting answers that was using code made by generative models, and Monday, we hear that Stack Overflow has laid off 28% of its staff, reducing the size of its go-to-market organization. Correlation is not causation, of course, but it seems like coding assistance tools hit at a very bad time for Stack Overflow. Meanwhile, it's also worth noting that LinkedIn, which also is incorporating a lot of AI tools, announced a further cut of 668 jobs there, bringing its total layoffs this year to 1,400. However, LinkedIn's layoffs are in R&D, so not as directly related to AI as Stack Overflow's. Yeah, you never like to see it, but if there's one no. that makes sense, probably that one. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Bethesda's Pete Hines announced he will retire after 24 years with the company and begin an exciting new chapter. According to a post on X, the chapter will include exploring interests and passions, donating my time where I can, and taking more time to enjoy life. The announcement comes after the launch of Starfield and Bethesda, is also working on titles like the Elder Scrolls 6 and the upcoming Indiana Jones game from Machine Games. I believe I might call that cashing out. Is that, <laughs> that, that, that what that sounds? <laughs> that sounds a hundred percent like yeah. that. No, and no shame, no shame in that no, at all. No hate at all. <laughs> yeah, well done, well earned. Uh, head of Mojang Studios, Helen Chang, announced during a live stream event that Minecraft has now sold more than 300 million copies. It was already the best selling video game of all time. It is very much still the best selling video game of all time. Uh, number two is Grand Theft Auto V distant second place with 185 million reported sales. Uh, Minecraft has been stacking up those 300 million sales since it was released on May 17th, 2009. If there's ever a proven track record that Microsoft is willing to let games continue on other platforms, boom, there yeah. it is. They built it. <laughs> AMD has removed its AMD Adrenaline Edition graphics driver after anti-lag reduction methods triggered Counter-Strike's 2 anti-cheat system. The feature bypassed CS2's engine.dll functions, which is considered tampering with CS code and result in a ban. Users who updated to the AMD Adrenaline Edition 23.10.1 update are advised to turn off anti-lag with the Alt-L command before starting a game. There are some reports of similar issues with Modern Warfare 2 and Apex Legends. Valve is working with AMD to ship an update that doesn't trigger a ban and will then work on identifying affected users and unbanning them. This is a rough one right here. Yeah, it is, um, especially yeah. if it happens to you, right? Yeah, che cheating is really bad in these yeah. games. Uh, Wall Street Journal reports that sources tell it Goldman Sachs is discussing internally uh, the idea of selling off its consumer business, which, among other things, operates credit cards for General Motors and its big client, Apple. Goldman has held talks with American Express about possibly buying the business, though American Express has been critical of how Apple runs the credit card operation. Uh, another option under consideration would be to let Apple take over more of the partnership. Apple has been acquiring smaller financial specialty companies, uh, indicating that maybe it would be preparing for something like that. It's kind of like, is that a good thing? I mean, yeah, yeah. They've, they've done it before with other things, right? Like yeah. buying chip companies and eventually making their own chips. This is a different 
industry for them to be in. Yeah. All right. Intel is the big news of Monday it launching its 14th gen Raptor Lake refresh of desktop processors this week. And the attention is on the fact that the flagship Core i9 14900K can boost clock speeds to six gigahertz out of the box. Now, it's not the first time an Intel chip could do that. The special edition 13900KS broke the six, six gig barrier last year, but that was a special edition. It didn't ship in large numbers. The flagship Core i9 14th gen is going to ship in large numbers. So it's a bigger deal. Uh, the flagship gets a new AI assist baked into the extreme tuning utility or XTU, which determines the ideal core voltages, power settings, and, you know, safer overclocking. And the Aurora R16 from Dell's Alienware can overclock it to 6.1 gigahertz. So you're going to be squeezing out some speed here. Uh, we got a few other notable things about the Raptor Lake, a.k.a. 14th Gen Intel processors. Chris, what are they? Well, the Core i7-14700K gets an increase in efficiency cores from 8 to 12 for 20 total cores. Now, that should help with multi-threading, specifically good for some games and creative applications. They work on Intel 600 and 700 series motherboards since Intel is still using the LGA 1700 socket. Support for Wi-Fi 7 and Bluetooth 5.4 in refresh Z790 boards support DDR5, 5600, and DDR4, 3200 memory speeds. And finally, the flagship Core i9 also gets the APO, aka Application Optimization Utility Program, that optimizes the CPU for particular games. Yeah, Intel says uh, the i9-14900K can reach more than 100 frames per second in Total War Warhammer 3. Uh, while playing, streaming, and recording in 1080p with ultra graphics settings. Now, keep in mind, that game obviously optimized for Raptor Lake. You're not going to get that from every game, but still, that's, that's a big old number. Uh, 14th gen desktop chips launch from retailers and system builders Tuesday, October 17th. And the pricing is generally in line with the 13th gen. We're not seeing a big price increase here. That's amazing. Uh, it's 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 really fascinating because it's it's a refresh, right? It's not a new technology bundle or, or or a set of technologies that they integrated. It's essentially taking the 13th gen and optimizing a lot of the uh, the layout as well as uh, some of the chip uh, chip internals. Um, it really looks like they're going and focusing mostly on enthusiasts slash gamers. Uh, with this, there's a modest boot looking at 13 around 13 plus uh, percent increase in performance, but that I don't know if that's enough for someone to upgrade who already has a 13th gen or even a 12th gen uh, yeah. uh, core processor. Um, what's What's fascinating is that they integrated the AI assist into the extreme uti uh, tuning utility. And having a separate a separate uh, utility application, the APO, to optimize the CPU for games. It's not unlike what NVIDIA and AMD have been doing uh, with certain GPU driver updates. Uh, so they're well, like the one that that triggered the anti cheat <laughs> earlier. That's a good example. Um, but yeah, it, it's it, they're 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 really focusing at least from the uh, from from the stuff that they've uh, released the details uh, really on the enthusiast and gamer section of the market. Um, it'd be Which great. is smart, right? Yeah. Uh, be, oh yeah, because they're going to be the early adopters. They're going to win that 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 they're going to have they, the they'll be your champions. Bucks. Yes. Yeah, they'll be they'll be your champions. You know, online streaming of game gameplay uh, walkthroughs. Uh, they're, you know, they're booming. These guys are doing really good with their content creation. And so if they're going to, and a lot of them take time to make videos about the equipment they're using, I'm starting to see a lot more of those videos. Like here's exactly what I'm using. Here's why, you know, here's where I got it and all of these things. So um, it would make sense for them to even take that leap and, and incorporate these guys. The sense I get, at, Roger, is that this is doing nothing to the AMD Intel race. If you've been preferring AMD, there's nothing here that's going to change your mind. If you've been preferring Intel, uh, there's nothing here to dissuade you and 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 push you away. Either. It's definitely if you're already in a set camp, you're probably going to stay in that in that lane. Um, but I can definitely see an effect if someone wants to do because one of the benchmarks that Intel released and during uh, was one of 
you can game, but they show the performance of gaming while also full live streaming that game right, out. Right. Well, That's so the frame per second yeah. thing, yeah. And the the idea, of course, is hey, it's not just about gaming; it's about making money from a pastime you enjoy. Because they understand what you were saying, Chris. It's the creators that are driving this. And if someone is doesn't know what to get, and they see, you know, uh, uh, you know, some guy who is literally known for, you know, being like the god king in Total War, uh, this is like, yeah, I'll go with what they have because it obviously works for them. Yeah. Yeah. The, the one aspect that I find certainly amazing about this is how if this is still a topic that people get excited about. I, I even heard a little excitement in Roger's voice when he was talking about this stuff, you know, because certainly like things like cell phones have definitely take a, taken a dip as far as new announcers are concerned, but this still seems to have that little, uh, little excitement there. It yeah. Does. If you're at the gamer and creator end, you still need more power, right? You don't need more, a whole lot more power in your phone. You might need right. a better camera, you might need be, be better battery life, but power is not a thing you th hear people who are using phones talk about too often. Although creators are still doing a lot more on phones these days. So there, there is a little bit of talk about that, but it's desktops that, that where you're like pushing it to the max in a professional or even an influencer slash creator or video game setting where, where you need, you need this, uh, that extra power. Makes sense. Speaking of power, Wired's Simon Hill has been testing true wireless power from a company called Y charge. This is one of the companies we've talked about before on DTNS. Uh, and in the fine tradition of wireless power, it's in beta <laughs> and it's being tested on toothbrushes. Uh, likely the first experience with wireless charging you've ever had was with an electric toothbrush, right? There's the Oral-B ones and, and the other yeah. ones that, that sit on a charging pad. Uh, you don't need to plug it in. You just sit it on the charging pad and it wirelessly charges, just like phones wirelessly charge now. Uh, the new system from Y-Charge works similarly in that you place your toothbrush on the pad to charge. In fact, I think the one that Simon Hill is using in his test is an Oral-B, but the pad doesn't need to be plugged into the wall outlet. You just need to make sure that the photovoltaic cell on the pad, it's like a little solar cell, can see the power transmitter. But that's where it gets interesting, right, Chris? Yeah, and that's the downside because you need line of sight. You install the power transmitter in the ceiling, so you need to cut a hole in your bathroom ceiling to install it, and you'll probably need an electrician too. Y charge delivers two to three watts of power by infrared with a 30 foot range. This only makes sense if you have more than one device to charge. He'll use it with two toothbrushes. He also <laughs> found uh, he also he also found the system used more power than just plugging them in directly would have. Y charge is also testing its system with Alfred smart locks. Yeah, I look at this and. and it's not something that's ready now. It's a little bit of a chicken and egg, right? You need to have a bunch of devices that use this before you're going to want to drill a hole in the ceiling, whether it's in the bathroom or somewhere else. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and yet you're going to need people using it before a bunch of device makers are going to jump on board. So I feel like, and Simon Hill mentioned this in, in his article, I feel like you need somebody to figure out wh whether it's Y charge or somebody else to be able to, how to put this in a light socket in an existing light socket. So you can just screw it into the light bulb. Uh, and, and then the install is easy. You can just use whatever uh, is already in your seat. Yeah. And I'd want to be careful not to poo poo this too much. Cause I actually like the idea of this because I'm a guy who has like, I found this cool little, uh, outlet that you plug in and it has a shelf on top of it so it expands your bathroom outlet next to your sink mm -hmm. but it also has a shelf so you can put stuff on top of it and i can't huh. tell you how many times i've hit the power cord and sent everything flying <laughs> so, <laughs> so yep. less cords is certainly appealing to me but that not at the expense of new holes and i'm pretty handy i could probably install it myself but i don't want to I yeah mean, right that, that's what it's about it's not can but will <laughs> I, I actually saw this device at the last CES we were at, which I guess is 2020. Um, and I was talking to the guy about it, and it was a very interesting setup because their setup was a model train. They had a model train that was being powered wirelessly, mm. you know, like a little uh, a, um, a railroad train set. Um, 
And two two to three watts doesn't give you a tremendous. You're not powering up, you know, a TV with this. Uh, although it'd be kind of cool. But I can imagine if you had a bunch of remotes that you never wanted to stick batteries in again, but you needed them to trickle charge while they're just sitting next to you uh, on the couch or something. This would be a great way to take care of that. Also, if you wanted to do something where uh, you needed to charge some relatively low power devices, whether it's like a a, a non smartphone or um, phone like a and like a, a door lock like out a the door lock. lock or a or video door bell maybe something like that yeah you could get away with not having to wire that yourself mm-hmm. into your home mm-hmm. right if you could just like yeah. line of sight door lock season i don't i'm done right that would simplify so much of that or having uh, to ch- worry work. about changing out batteries and stuff because yeah just, i'm a big yeah. proponent of uh smart locks um just swapped out the one i had at the front door but still you know that one downside it's powered by batteries you know the doorbell is pretty easy if you can um, run the you know the current doorbell wire in there, but the, the smart locks are a bit different story. Yeah, yeah. two to three I'm, watts is not going to charge your smartphone either, so yeah. I'm not worried about putting this in the smartphone. But I could absolutely see this charge a battery powered wireless charger, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's constantly yeah. over time making sure that wireless charger is charged. So when I do put my phone down on it then it charges up. I mean, it's not ideal. You, you kind of just want it to charge everything wirelessly without having to put it on a pad, but that might be worth it because then that frees you up to put that charging pad in places where you don't have to worry about running a cord and all that. I see once you get past the chicken, the egg problem, how this can catch on with a lot of the examples that Roger and you are talking about. Uh, it's just a matter of how, how you get people to start using it, how you, how you get over that hump. I think yeah. you need to put these either like in a hotel or like maybe mm. in airports where people's like, whoa, that's amazing. They, they're they powering this, you know, you doing people are doing this, trying to break the beam to see if it turns off. Um, but like once you see things like that, like having having a uh, having a, a faucet or whatever, or not faucet, but anything set up in a hotel bathroom where it's powered that way. That would be like... Oh, yeah, the automatic faucets. That's a good one. Yeah. Uh, You know what? uh, Interesting. Uh, Poor Genius 5 in our our chat room says, you know, those e-ink price tags in stores, they sound like a perfect pair. Those are using a system like this already Mm. uh, because they don't need to have batteries then. You just send the power to them to change the price and because they're e-ink, once the power goes away, they the e inks display stays there yeah exactly uh the the big downside is what you mentioned chris uh these use more power than being plugged in directly uses they are inefficient so if you've got solar power or some other kind of cheap power um then maybe that's not as big of a a concern for you but that's going to be a problem for people as well as they either for sustainability or cost reasons they're not going to want to increase the power usage yeah definitely some people but you know folks like us i think would choose convenience i mean for sustainability if you're ditching batteries that are toxic and and, that's true too that's another part of it yeah it might be an advantage good point part of the equation uh, well, folks, if you want to help us decide what to talk about on the show, we look at a lot of different sources to figure out like, okay, what are the things that are worth talking about on the show today? And one of them is our subreddit, where you can have a direct effect by submitting a story and voting on the stories that other listeners have submitted. So head on over there to dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We generally don't report on Apple leaks unless they are surprising or come from reliable sources. But we have so many today, some which fit the bill and some that don't, that we thought we'd run through and help you navigate which ones we trust, which ones we don't, and which some of them actually seem to indicate. Yeah, there's loads of rumors about an October iPad launch. That's the normal pattern, right? We have an iPhone in September and then an iPad launch in October and maybe a few other things at each one of those announcements. Uh, However, notoriously reliable reporter Mark Gurman and notoriously reliable analyst Ming-Chi Kuo both have said they think it's unlikely that there will be changes in the iPad lineup this year. So the question becomes, why is Mac Otakara claiming select media personnel have been briefed for an iPad announcement on October 17th. It could be minor updates like processor changes or storage options, but you don't usually need to brief media personnel on something like that. One of the rumors floating out there, which Makotakara and a few others have mentioned, is there might be an updated Apple Pencil with a replaceable magnetic tip and USB-C. 
you might brief media on something like that, especially if there's some other whiz bang elements there. And you might brief media, especially if you're not going to do a streamed announcement, you're just going to release it. So I don't know, Chris, that's, that's my best bet as to why we're seeing those rumors flying around. And that kind of makes sense. It uh, it's kind of odd to me that you would have your, you know, your I, your iPhone release in September and then turn around and start talking about uh, the iPads in October, even though, you know, you said that's, that's their pattern. Uh, I would think they would like to ride that out a little bit more, but maybe, you know, it's just about keeping the, the name out there. Yeah, it, it could be. And and uh, Willie Scott points out in, in the chat that the, the last iPad Pro, they just dropped a blog post. They didn't have a full on event about that. And there were some media briefings in advance of that. So so people could get a, a heads up about it. So it could it could be a new minor refresh uh, or something. But that's where I go back to German and, and Quo saying like, no, nah, we don't think there's going to be a change there. So that's why I think the pencil is probably the better bet. Well, to be and to be fair, in the past, I'd have been like pencil. Who cares? But uh, I gave my daughter my bigger iPad because she loves to doodle and draw and use that. She actually uses the pencil pretty heavily on her iPad, and she's actually you know pretty artistic, uh, especially compared to me, who can barely draw stick figures. So, <laughs> so now it'd be interesting to see that uh, I'll pay. I, I'll just say I'll pay more attention to these announcements because if they come up with something that I think she could utilize, by all means, I will grab her a new uh, pencil so and let her run with it and see what she does with it. Yeah, I, I would. I would guess uh, whether it's Tuesday, October seventeenth. A lot of you will know whether that was true or not by by the time you listen to this or not. Um, an Apple pencil with uh, you know with with USB C, maybe a removable magnetic tip, uh, maybe maybe some other built in features uh, to get people like your daughter to to be jealous and, and want, want to upgrade. Uh, yeah, I <laughs> I can absolutely see that. Uh, however. We keep mentioning Mark Gurman. Uh, what does Gurman say is in the pipeline? Well, he says new 14 and 16 inch MacBook Pros with new M3 Pro and M3 Max chips have reached the design validation testing stage of development. And 13 and 15 inch MacBook Airs with M3 chips have reached the engineering verification testing stage, which is the stage before design validation. This puts us on track for what I would consider an entirely unsurprising announcement of new MacBook Pros with new chips in them in spring 2024 or maybe summer at WWDC. Uh, German also said his sources indicate the less expensive Apple Vision Pro will run on an iPhone chip, not a Mac chip, uh, but still not be super cheap, $1,500 to $2,500. And there's one more revelation you may find intriguing. Tell us about it, Chris. Yeah, so uh, German's sources say Apple has developed pad-like device to update iPhone operating systems in Apple stores without opening the box. That way, you don't have to go through the inevitable long OS update during setup. Employees would place the sealed boxes on the iPad. The pad would then wirelessly turn on the iPhone updated software and then turn it off. He expects the system to roll out before the end of the year. Yeah. So this, this would save you time. Even if you get set up done in the store, I know a lot of us probably, if we get an iPhone, we just get it shipped to us and we do the setup at home. Right. Uh, but, but if you do the setup in the store, a lot of times a big part of your appointment time is taken up waiting for the OS update. They wouldn't do it then they could do it in the stock room. I right. could just go through and I, I'm going to guess they would have, you know, a dozen of these pads and they just place a bunch of boxes on them and be like, OK, these are updated and move them out, which is which is incredibly convenient. So this is uh, interesting from multiple uh, standpoints for, as far as I'm concerned. One is there is nothing worse than getting your phone and have to <laughs> download yes. a giant update. It uh, It is so annoying. annoying. But um, you. From my perspective, Apple has the, the luster of going into the store and getting that legendary uh, uh, Apple support in the store. It's kind of worn off a little bit. And, you know, obviously it behooves them to drive people to the store because certainly you see uh, earphone, uh, mm -hmm. headphones you might want to get, ear pods, whatever. You know, it gives them a, a, an additional chance for some suggestive selling. So if you could now tout this experience, well, you know, 
you get your phone, it's already up to date. You walk out the door, still in the box, brand new, clean. And I think that actually makes a lot of sense to kind of a put that, you know, bring that some of that shine back on their uh, legendary service. Uh, B, given more opportunity to sell more knickknacks and stuff like that. And C, make people happy with the, you know, a better experience right out of the gate. So if this is true, uh, this is uh, very, very interesting to me. It does make me want to investigate how Apple makes sure that only Apple can do this right, and not anybody else, right? Uh, and I'm sure there are methods in place, but the idea that a phone sealed in a box could have its software altered is both very convenient if it's done by Apple to upgrade your operating system uh, and very frightening if it was someone else figuring out how to take advantage of that. Because if Apple can do it, it's possible somebody else could do it. Um, that's always true of every method of operating software. But, yeah. uh, you know, if, if anybody knows, I mean, we this, this is all German sources saying they're going to do it, so we don't have any details. But if anybody's like, oh, I know how they would make sure that this isn't misused, how they'd mitigate that, uh, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. But this because it is the first thing that occurred to me is like, well, if Apple can do it while it's sealed in the box, what could I do? What could I put on there, right? Yeah, I have a guess. And I, I, my guess is that the, they'll start shipping these devices in a different state, like a one-time state where they can mm. accept an update. And then once it's done. And then that's it. That's it. That That could be. That that, that would be easy to put a flag on it. Yeah. All right. Let's check out the mailbag. We've got an email here from Nick in Australia for the main show. Today, I got a notification in my 1Password that I was logging into a site that supported pass keys. And I immediately thought, great. That thing Tom has been talking about for years is finally here. Time to enable it. Uh, it was super easy. Click on a couple of buttons, and now you have a pass key for the site you're visiting. I then went down a very short rabbit hole and found a couple of lists of sites that have already implemented pass key support. Two things I noted about the experience that I found unusual. First, PayPal will not let you create a pass key on anything but a phone using Chrome or Safari. Pass keys are meant to be universal, so that's a head scratcher to me. Um, Short interlude for me, uh, certain browsers have to support passkey too. Uh, certainly PayPal could support it on not phones, but it's probably just they want to limit their support costs and their development costs. So they're they're limiting it to the browsers they know already support it on a platform like that. It's probably why, just a guess. Uh, back to Nick. The other thing of note, and this is a good thing, is that Nintendo has passkey support. In the past, Nintendo's security practices have been shockingly bad. Those are Nick's words. Uh, like requiring WEP or open Wi-Fi to connect to the internet long after WPA was nearly universal and the dangers of not using WPA encryption were well known. So good on Nintendo for being an early adopter of passkeys. If you're listening to this and your device has passkey support, go and start enabling it, says Nick in Australia. Yeah, this is definitely pretty slick. And I'm impressed with the uh, one password since I've been using it uh, for the mo- better part of this year. Um, I actually hit a site just a couple of days ago, and uh, it actually gave me the option to use passkey as well, which I thought was really cool. Microsoft is pretty big on it with the uh, authenticator. Uh, and I do love the fact that one password has two-factor authentication built into the actual password that it stores, which I think is stellar. Um, so good on them for expanding this. Yeah, and it's going to be bumpy. There's going to be weird things like what PayPal's doing that Nick described. I, I've definitely run into situations where it says, would you like to use your passkey to log in? And I say yes, and it goes, oh, you can't do that on this device. And I'm like, well, why'd you ask me that? <laughs> um, but when it works, it's it's wonderful, right? Because you're just like, do you want to log in? Are you you? And I'm like, yes, I'm me. I want to log in. Done. I love you. Right. Yeah. Especially with the 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 date, the time, the location, the, you know, and the confirmation number. I, I love everything about it. Yeah. Uh, and then real quickly, Prof Metcalf wrote in uh, and said uh, said a lot of things about making sure that he, I knew uh, that this was not an angry email, but says, I'm sending this email is that Tom recently said uh, repeatedly that he thinks the only reason Apple didn't do something uh, to get rid of the red bubble, blue bubble is they love the lock-in. His words, not mine. Uh, my words, not his, I should say. Anyway, back to Prof Metcalf. I was kind of surprised, mostly because Tom usually tries to see both sides of a thing without assuming a company is evil. And in this case, he seemed not to and didn't seem to indicate he'd thought about it. And 
X is Y that's wrong. It seems like there's an alternative take that you are free to think about it or ignore. Here it is. Over the years, Apple has made it ridiculously clear that they won't support any optional thing they don't have control over. Things like Bluetooth and Ethernet, they ha obviously have to support. I guess I don't see this as any different than their normal response, which I don't think is typically about lock-in. It doesn't matter what the tech is. If they can't control the experience, they're not going to devote resources on it that they could deploy somewhere else. It's certainly possible I'm missing something major, but I didn't understand why this instance was different than the others. Hopefully this is read as genuinely surprised and curious, not as a polarized, you don't believe me, you're so wrong. <laughs> uh, thank you uh, for making that clear. And uh, yes, I probably did gloss over my thinking because I've talked about this in a lot of different places. And and, and so I, I didn't make sure to say like, I used to think there might be a reason other than lock-in, uh, but I don't anymore. And the reason I don't is because Apple has said publicly, uh, Tim Cook has said, well, then you should buy an iPhone. But even more importantly, <laughs> the emails that were revealed, intern the internal emails that were revealed in the Epic versus Apple case uh, showed executives arguing like, mm, we could do more interoperation, but we would lose the advantage of the lock-in. So it's clearly something they've, they've uh, considered. And RCS is a standard, just like SMS. So... If you're going to support SMS, it makes sense to continue to support it. It would be a little like supporting Bluetooth 5, but not wanting to do 5.4. Um, yes, there are other reasons besides lock-in, which involve the cost of development and everything. But I imagine it's the advantage of lock-in that make them decide not to spend the money on the development. That's, yeah. that's where I'm at. I just looking at this, I would probably argue that lock in is probably thought of first uh, in, in any in any or most features. Why? Just from my experience, uh, you know, I've managed software for you know 20 years now and any feature that I've added, I definitely try to find ways to make them sticky so mm -hmm. that the the pain of removing my product is greater than whatever reason you have to think about removing it, right? Because I yeah. want you to be so engrossed in how awesome my product is and how how it's benefiting you that you're like, well, if I take it out and want to go with a competitor or something like this, it becomes a, a, a learning curve or we don't have these features. So I, I would argue that they're probably thinking about that first. Yeah. And, and uh, so, so yes, I should have said like, look, there might be other reasons, but I don't think any of those wash the longer I've thought about it. And the more information we've gotten about it, the more, it seems like this is a case where they're like, yeah, we could, but <laughs> we don't want to, <laughs> uh, Chris, Ashley, uh, we did want to have you on the show and we're glad we did. Uh, what do you got going on to tell folks about, uh, folks come check us out on barbecue and tech. We are Definitely having some blast talking about some awesome barbecue. We just recently did an experiment with some pork belly. That was amazing. <laughs> and now I'm trying to invent, uh, well, reinvent the smoked chicken and waffle. There we go. Oh, man, this show, just a warning, you should go listen, barbecue and tech, but also you might eat your phone. It's yeah, that yes, good. Definitely. Yeah, they, they're going to make your mouth water. Uh, what are we doing in the extended show, Chris? Well, the European Commission. Uh, commissioner, excuse me, Theory Britain is keeping busy. And last week he sent four letters that we know of, at least to X, Meta, YouTube, and TikTok. Asking oh, them oh, oh. Don't, don't spoil too much yet. We got to, we got to wait till we get, we get there, but we're going to talk, we're going to talk more about that. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah. The, folks, you got to check this one out because this is super interesting. Uh, so if you're not checking out GDI, you, you got to do it. This is, this is a, very interesting phenomenon that's going yeah, on. Yeah, stick around. Chris and I are going to talk about all those letters and what they mean. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow talking about alternative internet options during disasters with Patrick Morton. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>